just uh, told John maybe I'd better be a little bit shorter so that we have some time for questions. And since you probably know much more about Canada than Norway, Finland, and England, that that's probably uh, going to be more than uh, permissible. Um, what I'm going to do is I, I just set out some personal history so that you understand where I'm coming from, both as a practitioner and as a scholar. Uh, in my own experiences. And my first experience was in the government of Saskatchewan uh, during the time of the introduction of regionalization as well as the uh, closure and conversion of 52 rural hospitals, uh, as well as a very significant uh, struggle uh, in terms of the second stage of regionalization and how we should position ourselves in terms of policy. And then finally, uh, towards the end of my time in government, uh, a very difficult, um, I would say, bitter strike, nurses' strike that lasted months uh, as we were trying to keep down the costs of services and at the same time, uh, after years of restraint, nurses and other providers were looking for a way to gain back some of what they perceived as their losses of the early to mid-1990s. And that, uh, that settlement then set a pattern, ultimately, for a number of settlements across the country. And this is part of the picture of cost containment. It's not a, as most of you in this room know, it's not some sort of uh, pleasant uh, discussion. It's, a, it's often a very difficult discussion because uh, what we expend on health care is actually the salaries and remuneration of many people. It's also their revenues and as a consequence of that when we talk about cost containment in healthcare we're also talking about the interests of other people and a natural intention is set up and we can't forget that because that goes to the heart and when when people say well governments just need political courage uh, easy enough to say uh, but the challenge here, and we just need to look in the mirror <laughs> to understand the nature of the challenge, is that the enemy is all of us, you know. When it comes to this issue, we're all implicated in this in terms of the sustainability of health care. The next stage was the Commission on the Future of Healthcare, which was set up in the midst of a debate concerning sustainability. Uh, and the third aspect of that, when I went back to academic life, I was asked by the Canadian Institute for Health Information uh, to write a report on cost drivers in health care. The information all uh, came from Kai Hai sources. They were looking for a way to put it into a narrative, and that report came out in uh, 2011. It was really the first effort to try to get at the real cost drivers in healthcare, the extent to which uh, they were cost drivers uh, over a fairly lengthy period, as well as the, the period uh, right up to 2008 from about 1997, where we had seen very significant cost escalation. And then most recently, uh, involved in a project um, that produced this book uh, that you see the cover displayed on the screen, which have brought together a number of, of authors across the country looking at individual provinces, trying to isolate uh, both the unique cost drivers as well as the general, the common cost drivers in the provinces, uh, as well as some of the more unique policy interventions to uh, bend the cost curve down. Now, that book was uh, completed basically the work on it in 2013 and then it was published a year later. So it's already out of date and it's an important uh, aspect to keep in mind because actually the cost of health care has on average continued to decline in real terms, that is in inflation adjusted terms since about 2010 and it now looks like a long term trend. It's very consistent with what we've seen in Europe. But this doesn't uh, do away with the problem. The reality is, is that the cost containment issue is very, uh, very much alive in governments. And the truth of the matter is, uh, if you're a responsible public steward for health care, uh, 
uh, you are required always to try to make it as efficient as possible because every dollar spent in healthcare is a dollar less in other areas. This is an opportunity cost here. And so whether you're talking about education, social services, highways, whatever other area you're talking about, at times, if you short those other areas, you're also shorting the determinants of health because the ministries, for the most part, ministries of health do not deal with the determinants of health. Those are dealt with in other areas and often not by provincial governments at all. Many of the de determinants of health are actually uh, where there is a policy lever, it's going to be more at the local government level. Um, and of course, municipal governments are directly dependent on transfers in addition to their own source revenues from provincial governments. So money spent uh, by provincial governments in whatever form, uh, that too creates an opportunity cost and must be kept in mind. So the fact that real costs have dropped does not mean the problem is gone. It's still with us. One of the people that we brought in as part of this bending the cost curve project was a health economist by the name of Uwe Reinhardt from Princeton University. The interesting thing about Uwe uh, is that he actually got his first degree at the University of Saskatchewan in commerce. He was a recent immigrant from Germany. He was looking for a cheap place to study, and the cheapest place in the country was the University of Saskatchewan. And he was a poor working class guy who said, you know, I've got to just get a quick degree and go into business because uh, nobody's going to hire me. That's why he was in commerce. But while he was there, uh, there was uh, the doctor's strike of 1962. And he observed this strike. He was absolutely fascinated by what happened. And he ended up um, going on to study uh, his graduate degrees in health economics. He went to Yale and then he got his position at Princeton. So in a sense, he's rooted in the Canadian situation. He was uh, there right at, uh, at a very difficult time. And he had a number of pretty interesting observations. Now, the neat thing about having the slides posted down there rather than in front of me is I can't actually read them, so I'm going to have to guess what's on the slide entirely. Uh, but he gives a pretty interesting definition in terms of, of, uh, of this whole question of sustainability. Uh, and basically what he's arguing is, is that there are two sides to this issue. One is, of course, that it's uh, an investment and is in a sense, the leading edge uh, in terms of economic growth in the United States and Canada and a number of other countries. But it's also an expenditure, and that expenditure represents uh, real wages, et cetera, to people. And that the, the issue of sustainability implicates governments in a way that is absolutely uh, one of the most uh, profoundly difficult issues. And it's one of the reasons that healthcare is a very complex area because in virtually any system, your providers are going to be to some extent uh, not direct civil servants in the normal sense. Even if they work in the public sector and they're salaried, it's not the same as having uh, a group of bureaucrats. Uh, second of all, that uh, there are uh, various ways in which you can deal with this, but they all involve trade-offs, and you have to very seriously consider uh, the trade-offs. Uh, and you're not going to have a situation that is going to be win-win. Th these are all very hard landings to some extent. So what I'm going to do is just briefly review some of the areas of, that are common cost pressures in the provinces that we studied at that time and some of the solutions that were being experimented with in Canada. Now, they aren't the full range of experiences that, that Richard talked about drawing on Europe, but there's still probably a broader range of experiments going on in the country than most of us are aware. It's a big country. There are 13 different provinces and territories, each doing their own thing. And wherever we're located, I'm in Ontario right now, so I've 
am very cognizant of what's going on in Ontario, but I'm less cognizant of what's going on in the rest of the country. We're all in that, in that position. Our news reports and our information about uh, reforms and about health care are largely rooted in the jurisdiction we're in. So the opportunity to learn from each other uh, can be fairly limited. At any rate, we asked uh, someone to look at this very carefully, uh, the, the a health economist by the name of Jeremy Hurley. He focused on pay for performance uh, efforts in Ontario because they had gone further in that area in terms of primary care than we've seen in the rest of the country. And there was more information, particularly picked up by the Institute for Clinical uh, Evaluative Sciences and uh, ISIS in Ontario, which uh, has a mandate to collect an extensive amount of data and provide some analysis. And based on the results of the pay for performance, uh, measures that have been taken uh, found that, in fact, the, the, the results were quite mixed. In other words, they weren't great, but they weren't terrible, but they ranged somewhere in the middle, and the question is the value for money, because these were also fairly expensive interventions. Um, this is consistent with a lot of the international evidence, and I guess the the rule here is it really depends on how the pay for performance incentive is structured. If it's structured in such a way that uh, it's already being done by a lot of providers and what you're doing is incentivizing the few that are not doing it to basically game the system, you're probably not going to get a lot of value out of it. On the other hand, if you get of a large majority of providers to do something they wouldn't ordinarily do, uh, and you're very, uh, you, your system is structured in a way that the way in which they go about doing that new thing uh, has knock-on effects that are positive through the rest of the system, then it can be fairly positive. Tax burdens and aging, uh, we had a couple of economists look at this associated with the C.D. Howe Institute. As you know, there's this great debate in the country about uh, what is the actual impact of aging. Those that argue that, in fact, it is, uh, uh, it is very uh, much uh, uh, a danger to public sustainability, those arguing that the impact is minimal. This paper, it, was, it came out, uh, I think, more tending to the former, but nonetheless found that it was not nearly uh, the kind of threat that some had suggested it was. But at the same time, and compared to many European countries, in fact, that Richard talked about, Canada is actually a younger nation in that sense. Uh, that, uh, that there are going to be some huge impacts in some sectors. And we had some discussion after our a meeting of authors about this. And in one area in particular, it appears that most provincial ministries uh, are under-resourced, and that is in terms of long-term care planning and policy and that we're really behind in that area uh, in, from that perspective. Uh, and therefore, there's not the kind of experimentation going on in the country that you would see in Europe, for example. We don't have yet, and we haven't conceived of the menu of options uh, in Canada that we probably need to. So uh, Richard's presentation, I think, is uh, very useful for that. The other thing about it is it has very differential impacts across the country, so that uh, obviously the Atlantic provinces are in a very different position uh, than the other provinces. And the kind of uh, policy interventions that might be necessary may extend to the national level. Uh, I've written a piece that argues in favor of a demographic fix as well as a geographic dispersion fix for the Canada health transfer. Uh, that would be one way of addressing this particular problem, but there are other ways of addressing uh, this issue at the provincial level. But 
what we need to understand is in Alberta, you're, you're, you're very fortunate here, but in the Atlantic provinces, it's like fighting against gravity all of the time because of your aging uh, demographic. Pharmaceuticals is the most policy complex area in some ways. Anything that one province can do and has the uh, policy levers uh, in terms of provincial jurisdiction will probably not be sufficient to grapple with the problem. This is an area where the federal government has an important constitutional foothold. It's the reason that at least branded patented drugs are price regulated at the federal level because that is where the jurisdiction lies. Uh, there's a debate as to who has jurisdiction over uh, generic drug uh, price regulation, and of course there are numerous other challenges in terms of prescription drugs, including uh, the, our patterns of, of prescriptions and utilization in this country, uh, and of course um, the way in which the industry is concentrated in a couple of provinces and the balance between industrial policy and health policy. And I don't have time to go through all of that, but Suffice to say that this is not something that can be solved in Alberta alone. It requires either a pan-Canadian approach or it requires the federal government to actually take greater responsibility in the area, which it could do if it wanted to, but of course it has been avoiding for years because of the amount of fiscal risk involved as well as the direct responsibility that that would entail. Next is uh, paying the health workforce. As you know, we had a huge ramp up in health expenditures, well above the rate of inflation from about 2000, uh, 1997 right up to about 2010. And the data demonstrates that a lot of that just ended up in health workforce inflation. The parallel to that is what happened with the Blair government's reinvestment in the NHS, and a lot of that money ended up in inflation. And we had very much the, the same phenomenon here. And so, and this is, can be demonstrated uh, and was shown in the CHI-HI data, that in fact the amount of money that was spent on physicians, for example, which rose even faster than uh, remuneration to other providers, uh, did not end up in higher utilization. It ended up basically mainly in price. So the price went up quite dramatically. So this is uh, a, was a major issue. That has since come down a bit. Uh, it hasn't gone away as an issue. There are still uh, parts of the country where provider remuneration remains above the rate of inflation. Uh, and therefore, we have to probably figure out how best to address that. Of course, there are other issues too, the substitution of, of, provider, uh, um, of providers and professions in terms of the services. Those are very complicated issues. Generally in Canada, our solution here has been when underserviced areas, we provide primary care through non-physician providers. That's what happens throughout the territories, for example, or in underprivileged areas like in Winnipeg where you have uh, the quick care clinics. But we're very loath to do that sort of thing uh, in other areas. So uh, if you want to really address the issue of uh, provider remuneration, you have to look at scope of practice and the uh, division among the professions. There are some differences and there were some common uh, features in terms of provincial uh, health spending patterns. Um, the common feature, of course, has been the general trend. And as this shows, and this is all in inflation-adjusted terms, in real terms. Generally, when you read this stuff in the media, it's always in current prices. I've tried to change this so that it's all in real uh, 
prices so that you can look at the trends more easily, the underlying trends. So when you take inflation into consideration, you do see uh, both uh, quite even high positive numbers uh, in the first and third phases. That's the phase up to the early to mid-1990s, and then the second, uh, 1997 to about 2010. And then, uh, of course, more recently, in real terms, it's actually been negative. That's with all of the inflation taken out. There are the common cost drivers, which I've talked about, but then there are differences in terms of, of some of the cost drivers that need to be taken into consideration. And these uh, variable cost drivers include things like population growth, the different uh, demographic structures, so aging is different depending on the jurisdiction. Drug coverage, provincial drug coverage varies substantially across the country. And so the, uh, you know, how extensive a coverage package you have, how big of a formulary has a, has a huge impact. Uh, and of course, you can address uh, a, a cost problem as a government simply by reducing coverage, by reducing the, the, the formulary. But that simply places what is a problem for a public budget, then it puts it on private budgets. That's a kind of a cost containment, but it's a very short-term cost containment. And that's why I'm talking about the bending the cost curve with an eye to a longer-term and more sustainable uh, kind of cost containment. Also, a cost containment which preserves a certain degree of solidarity. Now, the provincial differences in efforts to bend the cost curve, I think this is probably what you're most interested in, and I feel a little bit awkward here because uh, I know that the uh, Assistant Deputy Minister of Health, the Deputy Minister of Health, and I'm sure the Minister of Health are looking for all kinds of ideas, and Richard provided a shopping list, and I'm now going to provide you with what's been happening in the country at least till about... 2013, and you're probably not going to see a lot that's new here, and you're probably going to be a little bit concerned about the narrow range of options. But uh, I want to say that uh, we're probably in a transition zone right now where uh, governments are going to be more willing to experiment. And I hope that we're going to have the political uh, courage uh, to see that experimentation through. And we're going to have the mechanisms in place to learn from that. And one of the key mechanisms is to ensure that there is evaluation associated with the reform from the beginning with a baseline that that evaluation has integrity. And if that means it needs to be external, expert evaluation as opposed to internal government evaluation that that's still done. But that even takes courage because the cost of that evaluation can be up to 20 or 30 percent of the reform itself and governments have sometimes some difficulty in justifying that expenditure but if we do not do that evaluation we will never know whether it works. And I know how hard it is for governments to also do that for other reasons, and that is because as a government, you want to be able to declare victory as quickly as possible, and if the evidence is a little bit vague, uh, that can help you do that. But that's not going to help us get to a better place in terms of bending the cost curve in a sustainable way. Here's the variation in provincial health spending per capita. Uh, and what's interesting is there's not much variability in, in among the provinces. It's a snapshot in time uh, last year. But there's not much variation in terms of private health spending, but in public health spending there's quite a bit of variability. Uh, and uh, you can see Alberta here, and you can see Newfoundland Labrador. Uh, so you have some idea of some of the questions that may be asked in those two uh, respective uh, ministries of health in terms of cost. <clears throat>
And here are some of the provincial policies to bend the cost curve, explicit provincial policies intended to bend the cost curve at least up to about 2012, 2013, and the provinces where this was most notable. So you have seen activity-based hospital payment using diagnostic-related groups and other mechanisms in basically marginal experiments in British Columbia and Ontario. In Ontario, that sort of experiment could be much larger because all of the hospitals remain independent, uh, largely not-for-profit organizations that run them. Whereas in other provinces with, with regional structures or with single provincial delivery agents, uh, you, it's, it's, it's a very different equation. And activity-based funding, uh, unless these uh, hospitals are given some autonomy, really probably doesn't make a lot of sense. In terms of primary care reform, there's been every province has declared that it's engaged in primary care reform. But in my opinion, the most extensive primary care reform has actually been in Ontario. In many other provinces, it's been lip service, but the real structural changes that are required have not been uh, done to really facilitate uh, deep uh, primary care reform. Then in terms of uh, eliminating uh, uh, unnecessary layers of structure. Well, that's going on in a number of places, but uh, Nova Scotia has gone to a single delivery agent, clearly uh, with the objective of reducing administrative costs. Uh, and of course, that was the origins of Alberta Health Services as well. Uh, and there is always a lot of heated debate whether that's worked or not, with I would say a majority of, of observers at least outside Alberta saying, no, we don't think that's really worked. But that's the problem, is that the debate is heated because the evidence is unclear, because there was never the kind of evaluation associated with that structural change that would allow us to say anything very definite. And the same thing applies to Nova Scotia, going to that single delivery. We just will not know what the outcome from that structural change will be. So uh, we, do, we have other kinds of experiments. We have other provinces that have kept their regional structures intact but have decided to try to gain economies and scale through what we call back office kinds of uh, amalgamations in which payroll, uh, IT, et cetera, is being managed on a provincial-wide basis, even though at the administrative and delivery side, it's done on a regional health authority level. Again, there has not been evaluation of these experiments, which is really unfortunate, because we do live in this laboratory of 13 jurisdictions. The uh, next is in lean process reforms, uh, very extensively experimented with in Saskatchewan. There was supposed to be uh, a very, uh, I would say, an external evaluation set up to the best of my knowledge that was never, ever really uh, done. So again, there's heated debate about the impact of these lean reforms, but uh, we know very little about the outcome. Um, the next is substitution of providers. We've seen that to some extent in Manitoba and Ontario uh, in very designated areas. So one of the primary care models involves nurse-based primary care in Ontario, but it's limited again to underserviced areas. It's not, it's not competing with the other models per se. It's going into areas where there is no competition. So we really don't know uh, the outcome of that, and then in, uh, in the same in Manitoba in terms of the quick care clinics. There's been a very high investment in assisted living uh, and in uh, home care in British Columbia to try to delay entry into long-term care or perhaps even avoid entry into long-term care. Um, there has been a real effort in terms of contracting out of elective surgery out of large hospitals to uh, 
smaller, very specialized surgical clinics in various jurisdictions. You're no strangers to that in Alberta, but again, virtually no evaluation. And of course, controlling uh, wages and remuneration, and that has been a real hodgepodge in the country. And the last thing I want to raise is what is ongoing right now. It's a major drama, and that is this ongoing debate between the federal government and the provinces. The first ministers are involved, the health ministers are involved, and the finance ministers are involved. So you have this concept of deus ex machina, and I'm very familiar with it because we engaged in the same thing when I was in government, the government of Saskatchewan, which is, you know, if you're not getting everything and you can't get your provincial situation the way you want it, you can't get to a surplus, you're still in deficit, you know that you're trying your best to control costs, but you're not getting them down to where you need to get them, uh, the one thing you can always do is you can demand that the federal government increase its health transfer. <laughs> and that's not about health policy. Don't get that. Just because it's called the Canada Health Transfer doesn't mean it has anything at all to do with health care. It has everything to do with getting money into the general revenue fund of your province. And you don't have to raise that money. So it comes from outside. Uh, and it is a kind of a shortcut. It is, in a sense, a way of dealing with the situation without really dealing with the situation. Now, I doubt that it's going to work this time. Uh, all the provinces are united in their demand that the federal government not allow the escalator in the Canada health transfer to drop to from 6% to 3%. It wants to, the federal government to delay that. There's no justification for it in the numbers. Health expenditures are now running at or below 3%. And if you look at the provinces, and the vast majority of provinces, if you look at the numbers individual, uh, it's, it's basically closer to 3% than 6%. But the provincial governments are mounting their best effort to try to get the federal government to delay that so that they can get one more good hit in terms of an increase to the general revenue funds. This is not going to solve anything. This is, of course, just going to delay the inevitable. It also, I think, creates a very damaging dynamic in which uh, provinces say, oh gosh, we don't have to focus on cost containment or bending the cost curve, at least for another year. And again, it becomes a delay in dealing with what are the inevitable issues. Now, I think the federal government is going to probably transfer more money than it's legally obligated to do through the Canada Health Transfer. But as you've heard the federal health minister, she has argued that in fact it will not be extra money through the Canada Health Transfer. It will be through a separate mechanism. So I was asked by the Institute of Research and Public Policy to do a study on bilateral health transfers. These are bilateral agreements between the federal government and individual provinces. And we've done that before. The system of national health grants from 1948 to 1961 was one example. You have to go way back. But there was another more recent example, and that was the primary health care transition fund that was created in 2000 that lasted about five or six years. There were bilateral agreements in which provinces came forward with their reform ideas, and the federal government agreed to fund, in part, those reform ideas. That may be what's going to take place here. So it's a system of opting in, not entitlement money in which you try to, uh, to either opt out or try and, and get funding that's not a t with, without strings attached. Uh, 
there are huge impediments for the federal government to introduce this. And of course, most provinces are going to be totally against it, especially the province of Quebec. And I would expect a few other provinces will agree with the Quebec position on this. So this is no done deal. But I doubt that the federal government is going to put the money through the Canada Health Transfer. Basically, there is virtually no accountability associated with that extra money, and it certainly won't get any credit for it. And there's no indication at all that there would be any change, major change associated with that in the same way that it might be able to lever change through either bilateral agreements or by putting the money into a particular reform. The, uh, this is just a summary slide on the whole issue of transfers. And normally I would never talk about transfers as part of bending the cost curve, but it is such a part of the discussion in Canada that you can't avoid it. So I think that there's going to be some major uh, challenges here. The question is whether there's any area that can be identified for reform on a pan-Canadian basis in which some kind of dedicated federal-provincial di directional funding might actually lever change that would lead to bending the cost curve for the long term. And here we can see that there's quite a bit of disagreement and different governments have decided to focus on different priorities. And in a country this diverse, there just may not be the commonality. So if I went around from, to each province and I said, well, what's, what's, the, what's the big ticket item for the next 10 years? Is it pharmacare? Is it seniors care to, in terms of home care and long-term care? Or is it, in fact, uh, acute care or primary health care? I wouldn't get agreement, I suspect, in this country. So I don't think it can be done on a national basis, but it could potentially be done on a bilateral, federal to single provincial government basis where each provincial government identifies what it considers to be the key reform priority. And that funding might facilitate uh, major change. But I've argued that this needs to be associated with clear rules on evaluation and a process for evaluation and a way in which the experiments could be in fact disseminated across the country and we could learn from these natural experiments across the country. Uh, I've run out of time, so I will just say that uh, in terms of bending the cost curve, Obviously, there are no easy answers, and this takes uh, a lot of work, but it also takes focus, direction, and I would argue, obviously, political courage. But when I say political courage, I'm not talking just about the political tier of government. I'm talking about the most senior officials, of course, that advise uh, those governments in health. And this is difficult because inevitably these reforms are going to bite hard with respect to certain interest groups that are going to have a stake in the status quo continuing. And unless there is major change in certain areas, we're going to just simply be treading water. We're not going to be dealing with the real issues. Therefore, major change is required, and therefore there are going to be knock-on effects with stakeholders, and some of them are very powerful, reacting quite negatively. And we have to recognize that this is part of the process of bending the cost curve. And then finally, it requires leadership at a pan-Canadian sense, and by that I don't mean the government of Canada. I mean there has to be a few key premiers that will lead the charge for the provinces that will define a pan-Canadian agenda, that will get us onto a more constructive discussion when it comes to federal transfers. It's not all about gimme, 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 uh, and, and you get nothing in return, but something that's directed to the future that will be about positive change in bending the cost curve. Thank you.